So RFK Jr. went on CNN and uh, he did an interview with Aaron Burnett here. I'm actually surprised that they had him on at all, to be honest, because their strategy vis-a-vis any candidate not named Trump or Biden has been, at this point, just totally, totally mums the word, zip lips, got nothing to say. Like, let's just pretend like they don't exist. Total indifference, which honestly better than even like, which is worse, I should say, than being smeared. It's like you'd rather have your candidate get smeared because then at least it creates a little bit of a backlash and you gain some support. Whereas indifference is just, it's a death knell for a campaign. And actually, to be fair, back when the Republicans were having a primary, they weren't only covering Trump. They would cover DeSantis. They would cover Nikki Haley. So it really is on the Democratic side. They just pretended like Marianne Williamson and Dean Phillips and RFK back when he was in the race. They just pretended like they didn't exist. Total indifference. Well, so now, as you know, he's running an independent campaign. I'm surprised they had him on. My guess is they're going to, most of the time, do the indifference, you don't exist thing anyway. But uh, they get into a, a bit of a heated debate here, Aaron Burnett and RFK Jr. Let's go through it and let's sort of break it down point by point, because I think there's a lot of things that are noteworthy in here. Mr. Kennedy, I appreciate your time. So you're Jeff Zeleny going through the role that Jill Stein played when you just look at the, the, the vote tallies in the state of Wisconsin. Um, only need 2,000 votes to get on the ballot in the state of Wisconsin. So what do you say to Democrats who point to Jill Stein and say, that's going to be you? Well, right now, uh, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do, who I pull more from in November right now. Right off the bat, let me just say this. I'm kind of torn on this type of a question from CNN, because on the one hand, like it's true with the nature of our system and the way that it works, um, we don't have a ranked choice voting system. And so this whole idea of the spoiler effect is always going to exist with the way our system functions. And so, on the one hand, it's a legitimate question because it's like, okay, this is going to be his impact. He is either going to pull more from Trump or Biden and impact the race colossally in that sense. So, fair question. But on the other hand, that's like the only kind of questions they ever have for an independent candidate, right? It's never like, well, let's talk about what your ideas are for the country. Let's talk about your policy preferences and what you would do. Is It's like they skip the substantive policy debate and go right to just the impact you're going to have on the two major parties. And so I do find that kind of frustrating. That it's not like an analysis of the substance. It's more of a horse race, how will you impact the status quo type thing? So I just wanted to point that out. Little torn on asking that question. It's a legitimate question, but unfortunately it's like the only question and clearly the first question that comes from mainstream media outlets. All right, let's keep watching. What do you say to Democrats who point to Jill Stein and say, that's going to be you? Well, right now, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do, who I pull more from in November. Right now, I'm pulling pretty much equally, probably a little more from President Trump. Uh, like, I, you know, as you pointed out, I want to pull from both of them. But, um, you know, do you want a, like, kind of a, thought, a glib answer or a thoughtful answer? I'd always prefer thoughtful. Okay, I mean, what I would say is you have both sides um, using scare tactics. Republicans say that if Joe Biden gets in, it's going to be the end of the republic. Uh, uh, Democrats say if Donald Trump gets in, it's going to be the end of democracy. And I don't think either of them are actually going to destroy democracy. There's, we have institutions in this country that are pretty enduring. Um, and if you look at both those candidates, they're very different in their temperament. They're very different in their ideology um, their, and in their rhetoric. But on the issues where they actually depart from each other, it's a very narrow band of issues, and it's the culture war issues like abortion, guns, the border, and they're all important issues, but they're not existential issues. On the existential issues, neither of them has the capacity to address them, the biggest one being the debt. Your line of attack against both Trump and Biden is the debt? That's the first thing you list? The existential issue of the debt? Okay, let's be clear, guys. That is simply a right-wing argument. That's like the uh, libertarian economics types, the Austrian economics types, the idea that, you know, the nation's debt is, you should conceptualize it the same as household debt. Like, if you have household debt, you don't have a choice, you kind of have to pay it off. Like, you have to. It appears like RFK has no idea how the national debt functions, especially when you have a sovereign currency. He should read up not only on Keynesianism, but on modern monetary theory, because all this debt and deficit fear-mongering, I just need everybody to understand this. It's the dumbest shit of all time. 
It's just the dumbest shit of all time. Just just to give one example, Japan has had a a, a lot of debt for a long time, and even their debt to GDP ratio is kind of out of whack. And a lot of like right wing Wall Street types have been predicting forever a debt crisis that's going to hit Japan, and it never comes. They've been saying it since like the 1990s that that's going to happen. It never comes. Why? Because they they fundamentally misunderstand what the national debt is, what it means to run a deficit, how that impacts the economy. Here's a fact that a lot of people don't know. Did you know that public debts lead to private growth? Right? So from that perspective, you might even say, in many instances, public debt is a good, it's just a good thing. Not it's a bad thing, we gotta fear it, you know, this is bad and wrong and we need to reverse it and we need to make sure we cut it. No. In some instances, it's a good thing. Like, there are very positive outcomes that come from public debt. And again, I, I, don't, I don't think he understands it, that public debt means private surpluses. That it's like, that's the lifeblood, certainly of a capitalist economic system. So to, of all the things, and by the way, I also just factually think he's wrong when he says, ah, oh, the only areas they disagree are like the culture war issues. That is definitely not true. Now, I got a lot of problems with Joe Biden. There are areas where they're far too similar, you know, on foreign policy. I think both, both of them, we know Biden is arming and funding a genocide and ethnic cleansing. I think Trump would do the exact same thing. He moved the embassy to Jerusalem. He put his middle finger up to the Palestinians. Um, so in some uh, areas on foreign policy in particular, I think they're very similar. But economically, they're actually really, really, really different. Joe Biden beefed up the NLRB. Trump effectively destroyed the NLRB. Joe Biden beefed up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, Donald Trump destroyed the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, Donald Trump's number one legislative accomplishment was a giant tax cut where 83% of the benefits went to the top 1%. It was a corporate tax cut. It was a wealthy tax cut. Joe Biden implemented a uh, 15% corporate minimum tax rate, which means that a lot of these companies that were getting subsidies or were paying nothing in taxes, they now have to pay. Under Donald Trump, he outsourced 200,000 factory jobs. Joe Biden brought back 800,000 manufacturing jobs. We have the infrastructure law. We have the CHIPS Act. We have the PACT Act under Joe Biden. Um, you know, all these things are very different and very good compared to Trump. So I would argue economically is probably the area where Biden is way better than Trump. He acts like there's no difference economically. That's just not true. Like what he's saying is just not true. Are there some areas where they're too similar? Absolutely. But to say the only areas where they're really different is culture war stuff, that's not true. And by the way, that also sort of downplays the significance of said culture war issues. Like, I don't know, abortion seems like a big deal. IVF sort of seems like a big deal, especially at a time when, you know, we see what's happening. We see the Republicans are trying to roll back the clock as much as possible. So anyway, this portion is just is actually really pathetic from RFK. That like, so you say something factually wrong that like, well, you know, the only areas they disagree are culture war issues. And then when you bring up the, the biggest issue you have with both of them, you say it's existential issues like the debt. Turns out Joe Biden and Donald Trump are a lot better on this question of the debt than you are, RFK. Because the only way... You're going to get to the point where you either get rid of our deficit and get us an annual surplus, or you massively reduce the national debt, which is the accumulation of the debt since the beginning of the country. The only way you do that is uh, to devastate the economy, right? This is what we're seeing in, um, in Argentina. You have the anarcho-capitalist Malay, and he's like, I'm going to reduce our debt. And in the process, what ha he wrecks the economy in the process. He wrecks the economy completely. We went through the numbers in a segment the other day. You should definitely check that out. So anyway, let's continue. Now I have $34 trillion in debt. The service on that debt uh, is more than the, uh, the, our military spending. So, and within five years, 50 cents out of every dollar collected in taxes yep. are going to go to servicing the debt. And who ran up that debt? It was President Trump and President Biden. To get and George W. Bush. Like, what, what are we doing here? And why is the debt the first thing you're talking about? For just four years each. They ran up more spending than all the previous presidents going back to George Washington combined. Hmm. It's almost like there was a massive pandemic and a giant economic downturn. And in those moments, the government needs to be the spender of last resort so that we don't go into a depression. Maybe that's what, maybe that context is kind of important. 
is the argument here that you care more about keeping the debt number lower as opposed to keeping people employed and keeping the economy functioning? Okay, he just doesn't, he doesn't know what he's talking about. The chronic disease epidemic. When my uncle was president, 6% of Americans had chronic disease. Today, 60% is the biggest issue we have. $4.3 trillion that we're spending on that. And it's four times, almost five times our military budget. And it's getting worse and worse. You've never heard President Trump talk about it. You've never heard President Biden. Well, yeah, but what would... Okay, this is a serious question. I'm not being facetious or glib here. What exactly would you do as president policy-wise to address that? Like, I don't really understand... You're basically saying, like, there's a health crisis. Okay, so what are you going to do as president? Try to, like, remove preservatives from food? Or, like, I don't... What would you do to address that? That's a serious question. He brings it up, like, this is one of the biggest issues. And then you'll see, he doesn't bring up, like, and this is the policy solution. The polarization in our country, again, existential. The polarization is existential? Are we very polarized? Yes. That is certainly not the fault of the Democrats. Biden goes around all the time talking about how much he loves Republicans. So don't tell me that, like, you know, that's, uh, that's, it, they're, it's equally both of their faults. No, it's not. All these issues, AI, and neither of them has the capacity to deal with these. And all of those issues are created by a system of corporate capture, this corrupt merger between state and corporate power that has absolutely subverted and undermined our democracy. That's true about corporate neither- capture. Like, the point about corporate capture is true, but... All the other issues that he brought up with that are not like the actual, like AI, while it is potentially a problem, it is certainly not the main problem. Like if you're going to bring up corporate capture, the thing you need to bring up is unions being decimated, taxes being cut for the wealthy, um, bring up the subsidies that mega corporations get because they buy the politicians, bring up how the politicians only serve the corporations and don't really serve the needs of the people. Like, that, that's the issue around corporate capture. It's not AI and the debt and whatever other things he was bringing up there. President Trump or President Biden has the capacity to address it because they're part of that system. They're both being financed by BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard, the military contractors, the pharmaceutical industries, and that system just... And he's also taking big money donors. I, I don't know why he thinks this is some sort of an own. You picked your VP because she's a billionaire and she's hot. What are you talking about? It's how bad policies... And the illusion that if you differ on culture war issues, it means you're you know, radically different. But the real issue, things that we need to do to save our country, they can't do them. And if you vote for President Trump or President Biden, they both had their chance. You're going to get more of the same. If, any, if somebody needs, if somebody actually wants change, wants to actually alter those issues, they're going to vote for me. And, and yet- yeah. If somebody wants change on, say, the ethnic cleansing and genocide happening in Gaza, they would vote for you, right? Oh, that's right. You actually agree completely with Joe Biden and Donald Trump on that issue. This is a point that a lot of uh, people who were fans of RFK have been making. The point that they're making is like, you know, he portrays himself as this anti-war candidate. But he only means that vis-a-vis Ukraine and Russia. But then when it comes to Gaza, he sounds exactly like every establishment loser in the country. So it sort of rings hollow when you're like, I'm the change guy except on that one main, most important current issue of us financing, arming, and abating a genocide and an ethnic cleansing. To be president of the United States, if, if, if you have to be on the ballot in enough states to be able to win the Electoral College. Uh, You're not right now. Yeah, and, and, I and will be. You, and you, you, you believe you will be? You believe, I, mean, cause I, know, oh, I know I, I will be. I, 100%. I'm going to be on the ballot in every state in the District of Columbia. I, I doubt that. Because it really is very rigged against independent candidates. And so they make it almost impossible to get on every ballot. So he's not on that many right now. They're about to show a map. He's only on like Utah. And there's a couple others where he's like close to being on, but not necessarily on. So anyway, he says it very confidently that he's going to be on. I don't think he knows that. And I don't, it's actually very, very difficult. I I don't know. Maybe he's unaware it's as difficult as it is. I don't know. Well, you know, Eve, yeah. And I've said this from the beginning and we're already well on our way there. I think with eight, within eight weeks, we're going to probably be on another 19 states. So we were not allowed to get on the ballot before in most states because we didn't have a vice presidential candidate. You have to name a vice presidential candidate to get on the ballot in about 26 states. So now we have that. And we have, we have about 200,000 volunteers. We're going to, it's going to be easy for us to get on the ballot in every state. So I know part of the reason that you know, It is not going to be easy. That is the wrong word. Carolina, we had to get 13,000 signatures. We got 23,000 in New Hampshire. 
They said it would take us months to get our signatures. We got them in one day. In Utah, we got them in one week during a blizzard. So, you know, we're not going to, we have a very, very good volunteer army out there. So when you talk about that you had to have a VP candidate to get on in some yeah. of these states, right? So that's part of the reason I know you made this decision when you did. The person you've chosen is Nicole Shanahan. Um, she's a lawyer. She doesn't have government experience. Uh, obviously not a household name. And a lot of people have questioned why you picked her. Liz Smith of the DNC just today um, says she was picked for one reason and one reason only, the money. And obviously she speaks for the DNC, but uh, Mick Mulvaney, who was uh, OMB director under President Trump, said this. There's one thing we need to know about her. It's the reason that uh, Kennedy picked her for vice president. She's fabulously wealthy. This is the woman who single-handedly bankrolled his ad during the Super Bowl that cost $4 million. That's why he put her on the ticket, along with the fact that I think everybody else probably turned him down. Would you have picked her if she didn't have the money? Yeah, did you see her speech? Part of it, but I, I mean, I'm just asking. I mean, did you pick? I, I, mean, I don't think anybody who watched that speech would ever say that she was. Yeah, <laughs> of course they would. What are you saying? <laughs> Is it what? No, absurd. That's not why. Anybody who saw her speech would know I didn't pick her because she's phenomenally wealthy and hot. What? Come on, man. Come on. It would be more refreshing if he was honest about it. And he was like, "Yeah, I'm an independent candidate. I desperately need the money," and. She, I agree with her on policy. I think she's a serious enough person. But yeah, the money helps a lot. Just don't do this. Oh, how could you? Like, stop it. As if she's eloquent, she's authentic. Her life is the, it's the template for the American dream. She started out as a, a minority kid in Oakland, extraordinary poverty, on food stamps, on welfare. She grew up and attended Stanford. Well, she became a Stanford fellow. She became an entrepreneur. She's a very, very uber successful businesswoman. She Weird. She's leaving out the part where uh, she married a billionaire and shook him down. <laughs> Come on, dog. Encyclopedic knowledge of AI. She has an encyclopedic knowledge of, of chronic disease epidemic and how to stop it. She is young and she's a mother. And I wanted, in my candidate, I want three things. One, Somebody who was not an insider. Some because it was the insiders who created this problem. They created the debt crisis. They created the, the addictions war. They created the chronic disease epidemic. The debt crisis again. Him with the debt. Created the polarization. I wanted somebody outside who's thinking outside of the box. I want to, our campaign is for young people. We are, you know, we're the only campaign that is looking at this assault on our children, on what is happening to this young generation. So I wanted somebody who is young, who is not, you know, an 80 year old man. I wanted somebody who's a mother. I wanted somebody who's going to champion their issues. And, if I, and I don't think anybody who looked at Nicole Shanahan's speech, which I urge people to do, would ever say that the reason that I picked her was for her money. By the way, we don't need her money to get on the ballot in every state. We already have the biggest field operation of any campaign. We are going to have no problem getting on the ballot in every state. We did not need Nicole Shanahan's money, and we're going to... He's been saying this thing. I just got, of course, I'm going to be on the ballot, bro. It's easy to get on the ballot, bro. He's been saying this for like seven months. And seven months ago, he was on the exact same number of ballots. So, like, you act like, see, well, why is that number not going up and up and up? I understand that with some of them, you needed to pick the VP, and you just picked the VP. I understand that. But you gained, like, no new ones in that amount of time, and we're supposed to believe, like, we're going to snap your fingers one day, and you'll be on all 50 ballots? Uh Plenty of money. We're raising more money. Our campaign is... And President Trump or President Biden. Well, so when, when you talk about, though, that you say that you're pulling equally from both, and we'll see what happens. But in the polling that we uh, have, I, but hold on one second. You, I'm going to just take Georgia, because we all know okay. Georgia margin of victory last time was 11,779 votes. So the latest polling from Georgia, you get 12% of the Democratic vote. You pull 5% of the Republican vote. Again, these are polls. This is where we are right now. But that's, that's, when they, that's what they show. So when you look at it that way, how can you say that your campaign is not taking more uh, from what Biden? I, what I would say to you, and, you know, um, I'm not... This isn't something I want to argue with you about. It's just what I'm, my observation is, and I don't care one way or the other. What, what my observation is of the Quinnipiac poll, the Harvard-Harris poll, the Gallup poll, the New York times Siena poll, all the leading national polls at this point in history as of today, show me polling like maybe two more points from President Trump than I am from President Biden. So I'm mainly what they're, what they're showing, and the Politico did a big article on this, is my supporters are people who aren't going to vote at all, largely. He's kind of right about this one. I've seen, I've seen a lot of mixed evidence on this question. Who does he pull more from? I've seen a number of polls that explicitly state he pulls more from Trump than he does from Biden. But I've also seen, like in over at the uh, Real Clear Politics numbers, when you do the head-to-head -head with Trump and Biden, right now the average is about tied between Trump and Biden nationally. But then when you add RFK in, Trump actually wins.
So you have some polls directly saying he pulls more from Trump and then other polls that when you add him in, it actually helps Trump more than it helps Biden. So it's total mixed bag um, to the extent he's saying I pulled new voters. I'm sure there's a decent number that he does do that. But of course, there are others who that's actually not the case. And they're just fed up with both of them and they're picking somebody just literally because it's a different name. Look, the thing is, the Kennedy name is Democratic royalty. So honestly, on that alone, he'll get some Democratic votes. But in terms of the stuff that RFK says, so far to this point, he's been coded more right-leaning than he has been left-leaning. So it's a, again, it's a little bit of contradictory, a little bit of mixed evidence there, but it really is sort of up in the air in terms of who he'll pull more from. Um, but that's the evidence to this point. Donors are people who had given up on the American political process and are re-engaging because they feel that they don't want to choose between the lesser of two evils. They want to choose a candidate who is going to inspire them, who's going to give them hope, who has a vision for the future. and who has a I got bad news for RFK. With you in, it's like the lesser of three evils <laughs> because you have the same position on Gaza and the genocide. He said some horrifically atrocious and idiotic things about Palestinians. Like, if it was just you three, it would be the lesser of three evils. Of course, Cornell West running as an independent. I think he'll be on even fewer ballots than RFK, to be honest with you. And you have Jill Stein running as a, the Green Party candidate. So there's more candidates. But I'm just saying between the, let's call them the big three, Trump, Biden, RFK, that's three evils, hate to tell you. Differing degrees, but nonetheless, still. ...an energy actually changed this country. And that, you know, those, those, I want to engage those people in the political process. You, the Democrats and Republicans, I'm going to take from the margins. And I can't tell you, even today, it's irrelevant, Aaron, because it's really, what, who am I going to take from in November? So you, in, in 2000, um, Ralph Nader, obviously, was running. And you did an interview with NBC News just a few months before the election. You said this. There's a political reality here, which is that his candidacy could draw enough votes in certain key states from Al Gore to give the entire election to George W. Bush. And then you wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. You wrote, Ralph Nader is my friend and hero, but Mr. Nader's candidacy could siphon votes from Al Gore. Mr. Nader dismisses his spoiler role by arguing there is little distinction between the major party candidates and that Mr. Gore is compromised on too many issues. While I admire his high-minded ideals, his suggestion that there is no difference between Mr. Gore and Mr. Bush is irresponsible. A moment ago, you said you, you essentially see Trump and Biden as the same, different, different issues. But do you really believe that? When people talk about the threat to democracy that Trump poses, do you really think that that is, is an equal... Yeah, evil I mean, to I, Biden. I, I mean, listen, I can make the argument that President Biden is a much worse threat to democracy. All right, let's be let's be fair here. Is it true that Biden is to some extent a threat to democracy? Well, I think yes, for this very basic reason. In the primaries, some of the state Democratic parties, my guess is at the behest of the DNC and the Biden campaign and the Biden White House, I should say. They just canceled some of the primaries. I know Florida was one of them, was it like North Carolina or something was another one. There was like three or four different ones, maybe even five, where they were just like, yeah, we know that Marianne Williamson and Dean Phillips meet all the criteria and are signing up on time and doing everything right. But we're going to go ahead and say, wrong, no election. We're anointing Biden and acting like he doesn't have any challengers. I don't, it doesn't matter if you agree or think Marianne Williamson and Dean Phillips are serious or unserious candidates. It's irrelevant. The fact of the matter is, the process is what matters. That's what democracy is. Have a process. Give people a chance. Give people their choice. Even if you don't, even if you think it'll be a one percent a person who takes one percent of the vote, you still have to go through those steps. Biden actively, and I think purposefully, acts that and was more than happy to be entitled and just like anointed and given the position as the standard bearer moving into 2024. So is he a threat to democracy to some extent? Absolutely. Absolutely. But having said that, is it an equal threat to Donald Trump? Absolutely not. Because here's what we all know. If Joe Biden loses, his ass will graciously concede and move on. There won't be a fake elector plot. So let me be specific here. To be clear, I think in the primary, they did kind of rig it. They did try to get rid of the elections. I think in 2016, Hillary did the same damn thing with Bernie. But in a general election, if Biden loses to any Republican, even Trump, he's going to bow out. He's going to be, okay, you know, I did my best. I lost. Not going to be a fake elector plot, fraudulent elector scheme. There's not going to be a January 6th of the Democratic variety. And, you know, with Trump, there was that. And he's basically, he's all but saying there will be. If he loses again, he's just going to say he won again. 
So he's going to refuse to acknowledge reality and refuse to step aside. So it's not equal. It's not even close to equal. So this is just a totally bogus argument here. I think they're both a threat to democracy. I think one is definitely a much bigger threat domestically with the peaceful transfer of power. President Biden is the first candidate in history, the first president in history that has used the federal agencies to censor political speech, so to censor his opponent. I, you know. There was also censorship going on under Trump. There was also censorship going on under Trump. And by the way, how directly involved is Joe Biden or Donald Trump in censoring Twitter and Instagram and social media? I kind of doubt that they're the ones pulling the strings directly on that. I can say that because I just won a case in the Federal Court of Appeals and now before the Supreme Court that shows that he started censoring not just me. 37 hours after he took the oath of office, he was censoring me. No president. You think it was Joe Biden on like day two or three of his administration? It was like, send me the RFK tweets. <laughs> like, what, are you, what are you talking about? This is delusional. Obviously, the people that were censoring you at these various uh, social media outlets were people who were saying, hey, man, we think you are violating our uh, terms of service when it comes to spreading medical misinformation over COVID-19. Obviously, that's what they would claim. Now, you might say, well, I disagree with that. Even if he's wrong about COVID-19 stuff, he's, he should be allowed to speculate. He should be allowed to even say conspiracy theories that are incorrect. And I actually tend to agree with you, if that's your position, that I, like, even if something's egregiously wrong, you should be allowed to say it on social media as long as you're not threatening anybody, right? But like, don't, don't misrepresent what happened here. It's not like Joe Biden was personally censoring your tweets, RFK. The country has ever done that. The greatest threat in democracy is not somebody who questions election returns, but a president of the United States who used the power of his office to force the social media companies, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, open a portal and give access to that portal to the FBI, to the CIA, to the IRS, to CISA, to NIH, to censor his political critics. President Biden, for the first, first president in history, to use the secret, his power over the Secret Service, to deny Secret Service protection to one of his political opponents. We have no idea if Joe Biden made that decision. In fact, I believe it's the head of the Department of Homeland Security who determines whether or not somebody can get Secret Service if they're running for president. If you get over a certain threshold, if you get over, I think it's 15% for an extended period of time um, in your average, then you're entitled to it. Uh, but he hasn't hit that threshold in the average. And so it's up to the discretion of the Department of Homeland Security. I don't know if it was Joe Biden who specifically made that decision. And I don't think he does either, but he just states it confidently, which is really obnoxious. For political reasons, he's weaponizing the federal agencies. Those are really critical threats Donald to democracy. Donald Trump, of course, tried to overturn a free and fair election. He tried to overturn one, right? He's, he's still fighting in court. Yes. He's a, how is that not a threat to democracy? Well, I think that is a threat to democracy. If he, he, him overthrow, trying to overthrow the election clearly is a threat to democracy. But the, the question was, who is a worse threat to democracy? And what I would say is, I, you know, I'm not going to answer that question, but I can argue that President Biden is because the First Amendment, Aaron, is the most important. Adams and Hamilton and Madison said... We put the guarantee of freedom of expression in the First Amendment because all of our other constitutional so, rights depend on it. If you have a government that can silence its opponents, it has license for any atrocity. Okay. Now, okay, now that annoys the shit out of me. Saying Biden is a bigger threat to the First Amendment, Donald Trump has a track record of despising the First Amendment. When he was president, he had tried to revive the idea that you could punish somebody for burning an American flag. That is like one of the main free speech cases in U.S. history where the decision was, even from conservative justices, we might not like it, but this is definitely squarely under the First Amendment and protected speech to burn a flag. Trump said you should punish those people with a year in jail. Trump famously said we need to open up the libel laws in this country and be more like the U.K. to go after the media when they're unfair to us. Trump sued Bill Maher over a joke that he didn't like. Trump recently tried to sue CNN for like $600 million because they didn't like the shit they were saying about him. Who are we kidding here? You think Trump is not a threat to the First Amendment? Anytime anybody says anything he doesn't like, he's litigious and he sues them and he tries to shut them the fuck up. Don't give me... Oh. I can't... I don't... For the life of me, I cannot wrap my mind around the people who pretend like Trump is some sort of First Amendment or free speech hero. He's not even close. He's deeply against the First Amendment. It's such a tortured argument to try to make to say that uh, you know, Biden is a bigger threat to democracy than Trump. Trump already literally tried to overturn the previous election. 
for all of Biden's flaws, and he has many, we all, everybody knows, come on, nobody, nobody would honestly disagree that Joe Biden would lose if he lost a general election, uh, that Joe Biden would walk away if he lost a general election. Everybody knows he'd walk away. Are you kidding me? Claire, you're saying you could make an argument that President Biden is a worse threat to democracy than, than Donald Absolutely. Trump. Absolutely. But who else has ever tried to, who else has ever tried to send what president in history mm-hmm. has ever tried to censor political opponents? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. A lot of this social media censorship stuff was happening under Trump. By the way, put aside that stuff. Look at the Edward Snowdens and the Chelsea Mannings and the Julian Assanges. And like, this is not new. This is not new. Even though I don't like RFK, um, I do think the media should have him on. Because it's only, it's only fair, right? And even again, even though I don't like him, I think he has a right to be on those ballots. I don't think the process should be this hard to get on the ballots. I don't think it should cost as much money as it does. I don't think it should be as burdensome as it is. I think they do that purposefully to try to protect the status quo and make sure either a Democrat or a Republican wins. Honestly, we need to totally retool the way we do elections. I don't like the Electoral College. I would like the straight popular vote. I love the idea of ranked choice voting. That removes even the potential argument, theoretically, of having a spoiler. We need to do that but we have a very, very flawed system. I think what he's doing is doomed to failure, but I also think he deserves to be heard out. And uh, clearly most of the stuff he says here I disagree with, but what'd you expect? Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop and watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.